Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Las Vegas Raiders Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Hondo Carboner. Of course, you can follow all that we do at Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation uh, Raiders today. When you go to si.com forward slash NFL forward slash Raiders, you can follow me on Instagram at Hondo SR or X, formerly known as Twitter, when you go to at Hondo Carpenter. Our next guy needs no introduction. Close to 20 years, two decades. He and I have been working together each and every week on radio and now on podcasts, bringing you a very macro look at the NFL, the National Football League, everything that impacts the Raiders. <clears throat> and usually the show is very micro with the Raiders. On this show, it can be micro or macro. It's all Raider related, but sometimes it's looking at things from a much broader standpoint. John is a terrific journalist, a very successful attorney in the Buckhead area of Atlanta. And we love having them on each and every week. John, how you doing, brother Johnny Guitars? I'm doing good. I got the iPads ready. I got the notes ready. And I know people, they don't all like this, but here we are. We're going around the NFL from a Raider perspective. So we're looking around the whole NFL from that Raider perspective. In a sense, this is next year. Next year has begun. Everybody's turning over. They're cultivating. We're ready to start 2024. The Raiders are ready as well. You know, a lot of people don't get it, <clears throat> but the Super Bowl we just had, even though it was conducted in the year 2024, it's still the 2023 um, Super Bowl. Now when you start getting to Combine and, and everything else, then it becomes, of course, 2023 in the NFL, and the new league year starts next week, or next week, next month, of course, with free agency. John, uh, real quick, I want you to share with everybody – your Twitter handle, tell them where to find you. Cause I've had a couple of people say, Hey, when you have guests, can you tell us how to find them? Tell them how to find you. My handle has never changed. It's at JP Spartan at JP Spartan is my handle. And I, without a doubt, I follow Hondo and all this stuff, of course, but I like the Instagram stuff maybe more than ever, more than any of them, because it gives you cool clips and it shows you the words also in case you're not listening a lot of good stuff out there, a lot of junk out there, but it remains a great tool for breaking news, breaking news in the NFL. As we see teams starting to shape their rosters, cut guys, move guys, sign guys, obviously filling out staffs, all that stuff's good to keep an eye on, and everyone knows where to go to follow the Raiders firsthand. You know, John, <clears throat> it amazes me. We've had our IG now, I'm going to guess, a month. We've only, you know, it's only at 3,800 people, but it's still growing very, very fast. Our Twitter's through the roof, in, you know, plus all of our other social media. Just amazes me. We set records in viewership this month, and John and I and all of us want to just take a second and say thank you. If you don't listen, it doesn't matter. There's an old saying, what do you call a leader with nobody following? A guy in a walk. And we just don't do these podcasts, and we literally – millions of views a month. You guys are watching, you're reading, you're subscribing. We're constantly trying to bring you the most Raider information anywhere on the net. And it's hundred percent free. We don't charge for it. And, and we tell people all the time, don't pay for what we can give you for free. It doesn't mean there aren't places worth paying for, but don't pay for what we can give you for free because we're, we're pounding out the information for you. And we, Greatly appreciate. If you haven't liked or subscribed or shared, please do that. Get that handle. But we appreciate all of you. John, let's start right at the top. We're going to get to um, Sean McVay and a hire that he made recently in a minute. But I want to start with AP. You like this staff. Now, tomorrow's podcast is all going to be about the new staff. But I like this staff. I like what Antonio Pierce did. I know that you do as well. Could you share that with us? A couple highlights. And I am extraordinarily biased. I like Marvin Lewis a lot. If things have gone a different way, if maybe some people didn't have hard feelings from 20 years ago, Marvin Lewis might be the head coach at Michigan State still today, and they're rolling along well. Marvin Lewis, a serious guy, knows defense, fantastic addition to the staff. That stands out to me. I like Joe Feldman because of his success in the past with specifics, especially really uh, obviously high functioning, high operating offenses and specifically uh, with his specialty, if you will. Carnell Williams, I like. Scott Turner's got some knowledge, got some 
pretty deep connection. And uh, one thing that stood out to me also, two names stood out to me later in, in the game, if you will. One is Rob Ryan coming in as a defensive assistant. A lot of defensive I, knowledge. Not coming in, but being elevated from not yeah. just in a defensive assistant, but to a senior one. I thought that was a big deal. Yeah, and the thing is, when you're talking about defensive knowledge, the last name Ryan says a lot. I like that one a lot. And I think people need to take note that Deuce Gruden is going to be around in the strength and conditioning. He's been around that for a long time, but Deuce Gruden is who he is. So that's an interesting dynamic. It's something that people will probably not realize or gloss over, but this is a serious, I mean, all you got to do is look at him. You know, he knows what he's doing when it comes to strength and conditioning. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting mix, but I like the staff overall. It pops out to me to be like really kind of defensively constructed, but it looks like there's a whole picture of what they were thinking, what Antonio Pierce wants to go for. And he thinks, of course, like they all do, that he's got the pieces in place. Antonio Pierce has been in organizations that function properly and coaching staffs that function properly. I think he's got guys that are going to get him there. I do not expect a big blip or a big problem. This is his staff. Those are guys that excite me. And again, I know I'm, I'm biased towards Marvin Lewis. I think he is terrific. And I think you're going to see a difference on an already good defensive staff with Patrick Graham. I think you're going to see really all bases are going to be covered. The Raiders should be very prepared each week. Yeah, I agree with you 100%, John. I, I love this staff. Again, we're going to get into it a lot tomorrow. So we're going to, we won't get as much today, but I like it. I like the fact that AP goes out. He knew what his weaknesses were. He addressed them. There's no ego. You know, a lot of people, because they see him and the persona, he's not an ego driven person at all. It's just not him. He is a purposeful driven per person. And um, I just, I like the way he approaches things. And okay, you know what? I don't care if you think I'm weak. I know this is an area I need some help. And he did it. Okay, let's get to it. Speaking of that, I want to get to a different issue. Months ago, literally months ago, before anyone was discussing it. And in fact, you and I took criticism about talking about it. We talked about how big game management is. And we talked about how so many coaches, they're so into the X's and O's and into the trees, they miss the forest when it comes to game management. And we discussed, you brought it up, so I'm going to give you, tap you on the back. But I agreed with you, the need to have a game manager on your staff. Now, we saw when... AP started as an intern a couple of times with some timeouts or uh, a, a, a throwing a, a flag, you know, that again, AP goes out, hires a game manager on his staff. And oh, by the way, so did Sean McVay, Super Bowl winning coach, a darling of the media. He does the same. John, this is so relevant. I thought it was a great when you brought it up a couple months ago. And I think it's great that people are talking about it now. Please discuss that. Such a big deal. You know, a lot of people out there, your time is your currency. You could listen to a million different things, watch a million different things. You're here. We appreciate it. This is what we're trying to bring you is some value, some vision, some insight. We talked about the obvious need for a late clock coordinator, a clock manager, a timeout manager, and... We've seen this over a couple decades. Now you're seeing teams actively get there and hire them. What we saw with the Rams this week was really maybe the most public expression of, I can't do it all. I need help. I'm Sean McVay. I'm arguably the smartest guy in football. The photographic memory. Some folk, look, I got a semi-photographic memory, which is great. This guy's next level he can remember plays that he made up the street here in brookhaven when he was a high schooler like third down and eight whatever game he knows it he needs a guy to help him manage the clock manage the timeouts this is a revolution coming to the nfl the teams that have this in place now are going to be ahead and they are going to make a difference and they are going to get somebody this year who's resistant to it 
what will happen is everybody knows in the NFL, they follow along all the other franchises that do not have a clock coordinator, uh, timeout manager, whatever you want to call it. Somebody in the head coach's ear saying, this is when we should call a timeout. This is when we should not, we should keep the flag. They're going to be behind. This is a revolution to the game that is needed. It's not to say head coaches are lazy. Of course they're not. It's not to say, well, shouldn't somebody else already have that? No, this game is changing and you got to be on the cutting edge. So when it comes down to some of the decisions we even saw in the championship games, um, I'm thinking about when the 49ers were down deep and they decided to, to run it in on first down. You know, there may be a time where somebody says, we're actually going to kneel on first down because we got to manage the clock and the timeouts better. We want Detroit to burn a timeout. We want to position ourselves to take the game in the clock, if you will. This is a big deal, but there is a huge stamp on it when Sean McVay does it. Right or wrong, like you said, a media darling, a, a football genius, the youngest guy, the brightest guy in the sport, when he's doing it, it says, wow, this is a big deal. Good news for the Raiders is they're already there and they are working on this. They are studying this. They're breaking it down. This is the time of year you have to do it, obviously. It's going to show up as soon as this fall. We're going to see a team or a franchise that doesn't have one. They're going to look ridiculous and look unprepared. And after that, whoever doesn't have one of these, they'll have one for the 2025 season. We will not see another pro football season where this clock coordinator is not a massive position on any staff. All right, let's talk about Russell Wilson because this is a guy a lot of people, somebody's going to be able to get him for the veteran minimum. He was playing really well. That's why Denver shut him down, which made no sense to me. But Denver shuts him down playing super well. And But he looks like he could just be a guy that would slide right into the broadcast booth, a la Tony Romo, really a lot like Alex Rodriguez. Your thoughts on, on Russell? Do you want to see him continue to play? I mean, he was playing at a high level, or would you like to see him slide into the booth? I don't know how much is left there. I, I know there were some dinks. There were some dink passes, and there were some deep balls that went well. I don't think his priority number one, two, or three is football. That's not a criticism, but I don't think I, – I, I, what is he doing playing still? Does he really want to explore, turn over all the rocks, be the best quarterback that he can? Or does he want everything to fit around him? Does he have bigger ambitions off the field? Alex Rodriguez is a great comparison. That's a guy he reminds me of as well. Rodriguez is extremely successful in business, no doubt. But he had a lot of other interests and maybe or maybe not that steered him the wrong way on the baseball field. He's a polarizing figure. Wilson has become more polarizing over time. I know people talk about he may be a fit for the Jets or he may be a fit there or here. Does he want to show up as a backup? Is he going to be a distraction? What, what is he still doing trying to play in the NFL? Mm -hmm. If he wants to be a public figure and explore a different kind of a life, why not take that transition and get on a television? He should be fantastic on TV. He looks like he's ready for it now. It's very hard to see him being a successful starting quarterback at the NFL uh, in many folks' opinion. Um, I do think that Denver shut him down because of what happened with the Derek Carr shutdown and what did not happen in Atlanta with Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan sticks in all these NFL teams' mind. Matt Ryan should have been shut down by the Falcons. He was not. Their franchise has suffered for it. Other franchises apparently have learned from it and have done it. That's what we saw with Wilson. And as we sit here today, we can probably put a pin in the idea that somebody will be shut down late in this coming up season. We don't know who it's going to be, but this is another trend with managing quarterbacks, roster space, cap, et cetera, I don't think this trend is going to stop. It was Wilson last year. It'll be somebody else this year. Yeah, and the Carr situation, though, Carr was not performing the way Russell Wilson was. To me, that was what the, the, the surprise was. All right, we took a ton of criticism, John, immense criticism, when during COVID, I began to sound the horn for the first time the salary cap was going back. And a lot of people were like, oh, he's just trying to scare people. Well, it ended up the salary cap 
was 198 million in 2020 and in 2021 went back to 182. Now we're seeing the salary cap. It goes up 20 million in 22, 20 million, well, almost 20 million, 16 in 23. And now it's up 21 million this year to $255 million. Listen, I think it is fair to say the NFL is struggling in some areas, because they are, but to in any way preach the demise of the NFL is stupid, arrogant, and flat-out untrue. This number is mammoth. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's $130 million up from like 15, almost 15 years ago. Um, the idea that the NFL was going to be struggling or going backward, that, that's obviously long gone. It is America's pastime. It is the single most popular form of entertainment in the country. And yes, there are areas that need to be tightened up. We look at this salary cap. The first thing that comes to many of our minds is expand the roster. We've got other stuff. We talked about that last week. We'll talk about it in the off season, but you have to be completely allergic to truth. If you don't recognize the NFL is healthier, bigger than ever. I think as we mentioned last week, a little bit, you need to probably, we probably need to give them a little more credit for timing the introduction and acceptance of legal gambling into the sport. If they had missed time that and not handled that well, if they had maybe opened that up before the phones were tied in with these app bettings that have a pretty good level of security. Uh, why do I say that? Well, we've seen players get tagged for doing stuff on property because of their phone. We probably need to give them a little more credit for that. But yeah, you have to recognize this is just enormous. And the salary cap going up is great, but let's see the NFL do something with it. Let's see them continue to improve their product, really take a notice and maybe expand the competition committee, stick some people on there who that their only job is to be on that committee. Exciting times for the NFL. I think about what Mark Cuban said. It's always sitting in the back of my mind way back when he said, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. I don't know if people heard him when he said that. The NFL is not getting slaughtered. It's got room to get even fatter from here. And we love it. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. I'm going to take one umbrage with something you said about it's America's pastime. Howie Long, to me, said it best. Baseball is America's pastime. But Amer but football is America's passion. It clearly is. And as the N as the NCAA game of which I loved for so many years is now tanking itself, coaches are jumping out of college as fast as they can and trying to get to the NFL, retiring whatever. As the as the NCAA college football is destroying itself, the NFL just continues to get bigger. All right, I want to talk about this. It's a new era in Seattle, but I admire the way the Seahawks handled Geno Smith. I thought the way they handled this was pretty amazing. Can we discuss that, please? Well, you know, Geno Smith should get a lot of credit for being obviously resilient. You know, he was a guy, in, in some ways, he, he looked like he was old when he was young. And now he's in his low 30s and he kind of looks the same. But what you see is he's... He has taken a lot of heat. He's taken a lot of struggles and he's turned that around to be a pretty productive player. Now there is a new era in Seattle and what we're seeing here, like we're seeing with uh, Derek Carr this week also, is we're seeing a restructuring of the contract. This is going to be an absolute constant. We know Dak Prescott, we got to do something with him in Dallas uh, here in the off season. We know, we don't know what that's going to be, but we know something. So what I see here is interesting because the Seahawks, have restructured Geno Smith. There is a totally new era. It's going to be a somewhat different, uh, you know, it's going to be somewhat different offense. And I think we have to have the expectation, like nearly every team, that the Seahawks are going to draft a quarterback at some point. And the intention is you got to stock your quarterback roster for a lot of reasons. So I think yep. we need to credit Geno Smith for being reasonable. And we also need to keep an eye on 
he's probably not their long-term answer there, but Geno Smith and I suppose other guys, they could be more of a problem for their franchise if they were like, I'm not touching my contract. And maybe we've seen that somewhat in the past. The trend right now in real time is that's not the issue. So I guess you can credit Derek Carr and you can credit Geno Smith for being flexible and reasonable and actually doing something to try to put their team in a better position to win from a bigger picture. Yes. We've probably got to credit, you know, who for starting that trend, how many years in a row did Tom Brady and the Patriots do something with his contract and probably put them in a position to compete more often. I know people don't want to always credit Tom Brady, but Hey, you know, Tom Brady's in the neighborhood these days. His influence is there. And the interesting thing to me is, okay, we've got these two. Now I want to see what other teams do. Let's see what Prescott does. Cowboys, Cowboys feel a little bit fragile. It feels like one or two things happen and, and, and they could kind of be back on the floor again. It's going to be interesting these, these months. So, John, you know, a few weeks ago, actually – probably a week and a half ago, I was told that the Bears had yet to make a decision on what they were doing at quarterback and that for the Raiders to move to 13-1 to one was going to cost three ones and three twos. <clears throat> I've now learned, and I reported this a couple days ago, that they were pretty locked in that they're going to take a quarterback. Then Justin Fields goes, <clears throat> unfollows them on all of social media. Now, you know this. I know Justin. I like Justin. I think he's got a big upside. And for the Raiders to go get him with two years left on his deal, you got he's got two years to show you something <clears throat> at a relatively cheap cost. I, I, I think this is a no-brainer. But um, now the Bears are trying to kind of well, you know, we haven't made a decision yet because they don't want the value for Justin to just fall through the floor because everyone knows they've got to get rid of him. To me, this goes back to Antonio Pierce speaking his mind now, doing the podcast that he wants. He isn't a guy that gets handled. Now players like Max Crosby have their own podcast that's not controlled by the league or the team. Devontae Adams is going to go talk to whoever he wants, whenever he wants. He's not asking the team for permission. I like this new age. I think it's going to make the NFL better the more personalities shine through. I have zero problems with Justin. I know his teammates want him. I know if he gets traded, they're going to be mad. But I like Justin. I respect Justin. I think this is fine. I have no issue with it. I'd like to hear your thoughts. It's interesting. The world of social media is more a young man's game than it is somebody our age, somebody older. They know what they're doing. So Fields comes out and says, hey, I took these things off my my feet because I didn't want to see him. I want to break from football. Well, I understand that. Um, he could have a second or third account, I suppose, if you wanted to do that. So it's hard to know what to, to read into that. But here's what I think of Fields. It, it struck me when I saw this story this week. I would be curious to get like three independent evaluations of Justin Fields. So I'm talking about outside of your franchise. I'm talking about maybe, you know, a, a quarterback coach, a quarterback trainer, somebody maybe from another team, maybe somebody that's retired. I would be curious to get an outside perspective. So I could go into our building and say, okay, here's what we think of Fields. Here's what we think we could do with Fields. Here's what these other folks think. How do they cross over. If you pull out the old Venn diagram, how do they look together? Where do we see some things the same? Where do they maybe see something that we don't see? Because when you talk about something like mechanics, it is a little curious. You know, is a guy with a longer motion and delivery like Fields, who can certainly throw the deep ball really well, is that something that we have to accept that is not going to change? Or do we think there's a couple things that can be done mechanically to maybe take him to another level? Because at this point in his career, it's either going to happen probably now or it's probably not going to happen. Um, you think about Geno Smith. Is he doing the same exact stuff he was doing when we started with the Jets? No. That's a real credit to being a real pro. Fields has a history of making decisions. He's made a lot of decisions. 
Um, this one may not be in his control, but I am curious what the Raiders would do and what kind of evaluation they would they would reach for outside of their own organization to really know what they think they could get and what they think they could do with him. What we don't want to see with Justin Fields is a misfit situation where he goes to some place that he does not fit. We have seen that problem before. On the other side, we have seen a clear misfit with Tua in Miami, and then a new head coach comes in that looks like a perfect fit. And we saw some serious success there. It is a very interesting thing to watch Justin Fields. It has been interesting to watch him since he was going to Penn State, Georgia, Ohio State, and now he's going to have this new adventure, whether it's somehow ending up staying in Chicago or more likely going elsewhere. I'm interested in what kind of evaluation outside of whatever franchise teams are going to get because they got to really know what they're getting and make sure that they've got a good fit. Otherwise, they should not be in the Justin Fields mix at all. Yeah, and I, I'm going to tell you something. I think you bring a Justin in – and you don't, you know, you don't coronate him as the starting quarterback. You still go draft somebody and then let Aiden. I mean, Aiden's here. You know, Aiden, it, what's, people need to remember, this guy did not play poorly. You let Aiden within the system. Let everybody compete. It just makes the Raiders better, and it makes each of them better. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. John, I want to get to a, another, just a quick point. I admire the Raiders having grass inside Allegiant Stadium. They need to just eliminate all AstroTurf, all fake field. I know in Detroit, the way the stadium's built, you, you really it's almost impossible to put a real field in. You could. But with the Raiders, they're able to slide it in and out like they are in Glendale. I think, you know, you give an exception to the Raiders and teams that are in positions that they can't do it, but you make it clear. Every team who can has to go to a real field, grass field, and all future stadiums have to be grass. The Bengals are doing it, which is stunning. Your thoughts on that? Well, the Bengals are going from an old turf, slim turf, to field turf, which is kind of the standard for these um non-grass uh stadiums which is good we've got field turf in atlanta carolina new england uh, detroit seattle so this is good you know uh we want to see constant improvement but people's eyes are more open they saw the injuries this year that too often were on turf there's questions about the give in the turf and look you know the astroturf folks are up the road in in in, in very north georgia um they're continuing to improve their product. We know it's not the same as it was, oh my gosh, in the vet in Philly, which was like the worst. We know we're not seeing it like we would see um, way back when, when the Steelers were playing in the same stadium as the Pirates. But what you're seeing here is the laggards that are the Cincinnati Bengals. Like, okay, we'll come along to the next level. What you're talking about is I want to see a future where everything is grass. I think that's a reasonable goal for the NFL. Maybe they don't even need to say it publicly. They just need to tell their franchises, look, the next time around, we got to go to grass. We're going to spend the money to get the tray system going, indoor growth, all that kind of stuff. But what's interesting here, they're not trying to pick on the Bengals, but the Bengals are, it's always been a strange feeling. It's a franchise that kind of started out of some bitterness if you know some of the history with Paul Brown and the Browns and it's got a reputation of being maybe extraordinarily cheap. frugal in spots. Yeah. I mean, really frugal and really cheap. And then sometimes they do other stuff where you're like, well, maybe they're not, maybe they're evolving. So a little credit here for the Bengals, but also do you want to be the last guys converting to field turf? I don't know. But with that being said, field turf is absolutely in everybody's eyesight. Everyone is going to be watching to see what kind of injuries happen this coming year, and the tolerance for it is going down, no doubt. So as we talk and we move to the mid-20s, let's see where we are as far as what kind of grass and turf are on the field when we get to, say, 2030. There is a good bit of technology for heating and cooling turf. It's not like it was in the old days. We don't have to have heated turf that's still frozen on the top. Good things are probably coming for the sport 
the best football is played on grass. I got to tell you, I had a person once who played in the vet tell me it was literally cement with the thinnest of carpet over it. They're just playing on cement with carpet. It, they just said it was horrible. And again, and I want to go back. I think Roger Goodell should come out right now. No more AstroTurf. If you cannot do grass, you have to do field turf. And all future stadiums have to be grass. I think he needs to make that very clear, very abundant right now. All right. Let's go now to Adams and Getze. And some interesting things there with their relationship. Devontae yeah, Adams. Can... Really interesting thing to me is Luke Getze's coming in here. They say, well, what kind of quarterback uh, are you looking for? And he says wisely with Bill Belichick back here, kind of in his mind, I've got to adapt to the roster that I have. I've got to adapt to the personnel. So I don't necessarily, I'm not just looking for a, a guy that can throw it deep or just looking for a guy that can scramble or, or make plays after the thing's broken down. This is interesting, but what we all are going to be paying more attention to and what people are paying attention to outside of the Raiders is Devontae Adams' real working successful relationship with Luke Getze and the impact that that's got on coming into the Raiders. I would think that it could be easily blown out of proportion. This is a wide receiver. It's not a quarterback. So I'm going to start with the default setting that this is going to be blown out of proportion. But when you look further and deeper, when you look what happened when Antonio Pierce took over, they started getting the ball to playmakers. I think there is a good sign. I don't think at all that this is the, the, the my way or the highway era is pretty much done. We, we've seen that. The square peg in the round doesn't hole work. doesn't work. We just saw, we saw the real struggles in Denver over a number of years. So what you have is an offensive coordinator. He's not coming in saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know. He's coming in saying, I've got to be adaptable. I've got to figure out what I can do, what offense we can design, run, and call, and execute to put the guys in the best position to succeed. Now, you make an interesting point that the Raiders are going to have multiple quarterbacks in camp. They're all not going to have the same skill set or same abilities. So there will be something to watch. I know we just poo-pooed the value of preseason games last year, but if you've got a quarterback competition, maybe there's a little more value in it. And for the love of the game, competition is okay at the NFL level. Players got to play, coaches got to coach. The old adage or the old days of bringing in a, a rookie quarterback with a big fat salary or just bringing in a quarterback and see how it goes. I don't want to pick on the Jets, but how did that go for them? Uh, I'm not saying there was any competition. Rodgers was, was clearly the, the, the top guy, but did that go so well? No, no, it didn't. I think you need to be able to stock your quarterback room with guys that are able, willing, and ready to compete. If Justin Fields or anybody else is not really feeling that, let's say there's a high draft pick who's been a little bit coddled, I don't want him in my franchise. I want guys that want to compete starting with the quarterback. Yeah, I agree with you, John. And uh, I got to tell you, it's, it's fascinating to me. I'm looking forward to being there every day at training camp, OTAs, mini camp, watching the competition with the Raiders. All right. Lastly, this is a draft that has a lot of depth, but it's got some holes. There are some positions where there's not necessarily that first round guys. Let's talk about the holes in the draft. It's interesting. We all know that there's heavy spots of the draft. We also know the premium positions in the sport. So it's interesting when you see some evaluations say, hey, there, there probably isn't a first round running back draft pick here. Now, mm -hmm. there are some good, solid running backs, and, and maybe they're a little underdeveloped, and they've got like one thing they do really well. I'm thinking about Audric Estime, of course, from Notre Dame. But look, they're, we don't expect to see necessarily a first round running back picked. There is a thin spot in the interior offensive line. Some folks remember uh, Saronsky, the fantastic interior lineman from Northwestern last year. This year, don't look for any interior guys to go in the first round. It also looks a little thin when you talk about the linebacker position and the safety position. So that in one end tells me something that maybe we don't expect to see these names going off or these positions going off the board in the first round. 
um, maybe too much in the second round. It also tells you and reminds you the premium positions in the sport. They are essentially the same. Of course, the quarterback, the cornerbacks, the offensive tackles, the edge rushers, those are the premium positions. I'm not sure, and this is why you need a competition committee working 365. I'm not sure if the league needs to keep an eye out and maybe tweak some things to prevent the game from becoming imbalanced. I think it's pretty okay now, but I fear that it's a little, it, 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 I don't want it to get out of balance. We don't want it to just become way too pass heavy or way too, um, really way too dominated by certain positions. There's 11 on the field for a reason. It's just something to keep in mind. So if you're like, hey, nobody's really talking about any running backs so far, it might just be because they're not likely to go in the first round this time. Yeah, and again, so I had heard, now you saw Matt Miller's report at ESPN, but I had heard interior offensive lineman, linebacker, running back, and uh, safety. safety were the four were the four weakest. So I, I think it's interesting he's hearing that as well. And because that's that's all that I'm hearing as well. John, what a podcast today. Again, a lot of Raider stuff with get with Getsy and Devante and the staff and all that's going on. I appreciate you joining us today. It's Combine Week. So excited to get going on Combine. We'll get back with you again next week. I can't wait. Remember, follow us on X follow, uh, at Hondo Carpenter on IG at Hondo SR and go to si.com forward slash NFL forward slash Raiders. Combine week. We'll see you tomorrow from Indianapolis.